Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Tick, episode 18. You got myself Ryan, we got Sam, and we got Jackson. Ooh. And this week we're going to have a little bit of industry news. Sam's going to bring us up to date with everything that's going on in the world of film. And then Sam had the pleasure of interviewing a Las Vegas actress called Julianne Prescott. Um, so we've got that. And then we're also going to be talking about how satire um, is used in different films. So other than that, over to Sam. So Bloomhouse are the first production company to take the steps forward to filming on film studio lots kind of thing. Essentially, no insurance company will cover uh, anything COVID-19 related. So Bloomhouse have decided to go, fuck it, let's just do it. And Universal will cover any of the costs if there's any problems whatsoever. Now, Bloomhouse are obviously quite well known for producing films within a couple of weeks or in a month. So their model fits this completely. Whether other people will follow it, we'll see. It's like, sure, it's impressive, but it's basically what we've all got to do anyway. <laughs> and what every independent has to do anyway of just like minimalizing everything. So it's like everyone's got to go in the same playing field, except from they still have millions of pounds to fund it with. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why, I just, I just want to have a joke about the Invisible Man. They could totally use with the, well, use the Invisible Man right now. <laughs> I don't know. Talking, <laughs> talking of Bloomhouse, Jamie Lee Curtis is making her narrative debut feature. She's making a film called Mother Nature, which is a climate crisis horror film. So that'd be yeah. interesting. As uh, in like, a, the, <clears throat> like the, the, the climate crisis is... Uh, actually what's the thing that's happening in the film or, or is that like a is there's not a lot known about it it's mother. called mother nature so okay. you would take the assumption that it's going to be from um you know like it maybe an exploitation film revolving around nature potentially yeah. i don't know we'll find out more information as we've discussed bloomhouse move quickly yeah so I, I expect she'll be doing that soon although she's also apparently doing a lifetime movie so i guess it's which one comes first it's interesting though, because of course she's got a good relationship with Bloomhouse since Halloween made so much money and was really good as the recent one. She's sort of felt more of a connection with them and a trust. And I think a lot of horror filmmakers have that trust in Bloomhouse and it kind of works, for most at least. The thing that I thought would never happen, I thought it was just fandom dreaming, has actually <laughs> happened. Snyder Cut. Oh yeah, I've seen this. <laughs> is actually real. And it's going to be released on HBO Max. Do you reckon that they've just taken this time during lockdown to re-edit it? I think they wanted to see how much fandom and how they kept pushing, pushing, pushing. That, that kind of gives is. you an idea of a knock-on effect. Because a lot of people hated The Last Jedi and asked for it to be like completely wiped out or recut and stuff. Well, the thing is, the situation is so different because obviously but Zack Snyder was sacked from the film and then his daughter died. Oh, Jesus. And then um, Josh Whedon took over the film. Everybody yeah, they, hated they, that film. They tried to make out like Zack Snyder had dropped out because of his daughter's death. So it really sort yeah. of like, bad. that's nasty. There's yeah. going yeah. to be an extra 20 million added to the production to bring in actors and to fix up scenes. I imagine it's going to take a good couple of years but those fans out there, you got what you wanted. <laughs> Things that don't exist keep just getting created for the fans. But who knows? Maybe it's the right version. Personally, I think Zack Snyder's like, he's one of those auteurs that's really shitty. But you sort of respect him for trying. <laughs> that, that's how I see Zack Snyder's work. Um, really random casting. I just thought it was a really cool pairing. And I, I, I know these two have wanted to do something together from reading stuff. It's not me and Jack. <laughs> Peter Dinklage <laughs> and uh, Jason Moama, who oh. obviously were in Game of Thrones together, have signed on to a vampire action film where Peter's going to play uh, Van Helsing and Jason's going to play a vampire. But he's like a con vampire and they have a little con that they go around doing together. Is this like a dark comedy? Yeah, it sounds like it could be a lot of fun. Yeah. And I was like, that's a good little pairing for something like <laughs> yeah. that. And the director of it, he recently sold a film at Sundance for 22 million just before all of uh, everything happens. So yeah, there's some interest. There's a lot of casting coming out. It seems like Hollywood's desperate to get back into the machine. So we'll see how that goes. Nice. Thank you, Sam. That's really good. 
And uh, back to yourself, Sam, with the interview with the Las Vegas actress, Julianne Prescott. I'm on Trash Arts Take with Julianne Prescott. How are you doing? You good? I'm very good. How are you? Yeah, no, I'm doing all right. It's, uh, it's, yeah, it's all right. It's, uh, it is what it is right now, but yeah, I'm doing good. Very true. So let's get into some questions. What made you want to be an actress? Well, I actually never originally intended to be. I I started out in my teens writing my own kind of sequels to my favorite horror films, and I was really into writing. And then as I got older, I started to do um, goth and alternative modeling, which turned into uh, fetish shows and go-go dancing and onstage burlesque performances. And so I started to fall in love with performing and kind of wanted to take it to the next level. I started adding a lot more props, a lot more theatrical elements to my shows. And then um, I was recommended to try out just in our local newspaper that was doing, you know, they would do calls. And I was encouraged to go do one. And I actually didn't get it the first time. I ended up doing spokes modeling at conventions. And then um, one of the companies I worked with recommended me for my first film. And it's actually an anthology called Slices that you can still buy and rent today. That It's pretty amazing to look back and see that that's where my start was. But that's kind of how I got into it. And I've, I've loved that. And I felt it was the perfect hobby and outlet and also professional path for me as it's kind of morphed over the years. So would you consider that film to be like the first role that really set you on the path of where you wanted to go? Or was there a, a particular character after that that made you go, this is the direction? I just, I really loved the atmosphere. And ever since I did that one, I just, I really, I, I'm a huge horror fan. It's the major, majority of what I watch and have since I was very young. And being able to go on a set and see how it works and be part of it and bring it to life. That to me is what made me fall in love with acting from that very first one on just making friends, being in that environment again, just being able to interact with other people, creating this whole thing that people can watch and enjoy and be fans of themselves. So that's really what keeps me going and has ever since I started just being in the whole process have you found like slight advantages working within horror like as an actress as an independent actress do you find working horror is more time worthy or like not not so much time worthy but more it can progress you more in your career than um other forms of indie filmmaking i think there's definitely more of an appreciation like i say this often and it's i think the best way to describe it is there aren't really like romantic comedy conventions or, you know, die hard romantic comedy um, fans that really cosplay or feel very strongly or network together as friends to have these get togethers or events of whatever kind. Um, the horror community is very special. It's the people that are in love with horror films are unlike other fans of genres as far as I'm concerned I feel that they're very special with their passion and their love for it and I think it stems off of personal things that they get out of watching these films that resonate with them that they're not going to get anywhere else so I find personally and then also being a fan of it myself it's where I want to be for all of those reasons because I feel like I'm finding friends, like I'm connecting with friends and also I just have such a passion for it as well and I, I think it's something that's really common in the horror genre and the community itself. No, I completely agree with you. I mean, the one thing I love about the uh, the indie horror community is always there's always an appreciation and kind of respect of other filmmakers around you and it does feel like yes. more of a friendly community. Plus there's that <clears throat> there's that excitement to see what they're bringing to the horror genre this time, which you kind of don't get there's with so other much. genres. There's so much support um, on all ends that I've seen. There's so much support for people in the horror community. And like you said, filmmakers as well. It, it just, 
to me, it's very special that everyone is really looking to raise each other up and looking to, you know, buy physical media, buy merchandise, promote other people, give other people a chance, um, you know, give people the heads up for casting inquiries. And I think that it also stems from the community having that passion individually for the genre, but it also comes out professionally for the people working in it. No, most definitely. And one person who we both know who represents this so well is Dustin Ferguson with SoCal uh, Studios. Now, you've done quite a few projects with him. Would you tell us about working with him? I love him. He is one of my favorite people to work with ever. I really, really have so much respect and admiration for him. He's working constantly so hard. But for everything that he works on, he has so much passion for it. He has turned his whole career into this just huge, amazing little like world in and of itself where he has so many people that he supports and brings up and raises up. And I feel very honored to be one of those people that he takes such good care of everyone that he works with. He's so creative. He's funny. He always provides such a safe environment. Um, He's always looking out for, if everyone's taken care of, anything that we need. Um, It never feels, you know, like he's unapproachable. You can talk to him about anything. He's definitely got a lot of integrity and one of the, you know, most, I respect him as one of the best people that I work with, which is why I'm always going back as much as I can. And uh, he always has a lot of respect return for everyone that he works with. No, I, I completely agree with that, and uh, I've worked with Dustin a few times, and I'm hoping to uh, produce the remake of Terra Blattery Forest in the future. And he's always good to talk to, and, and he's always got such encouragement and works quicker than anyone else around. Oh, he really, and, and he always has such attention to detail. It's like, when he goes in to film something, he already knows what he's looking for. He specifically is no nonsense with it. It's exactly planned out everything, the way he views it, where he wants it to look, how he wants it to be portrayed. I mean, he really is so smart with it. It's, it doesn't waste any time. He really gets it done and he gets it done so well and so enjoyable. Still, it doesn't feel like, okay, go, go, go. It always feels like, you know, you have enough time with him and you know, it's going to be exactly what, you went in there to achieve and then you know you're going to see it and you're going to get you know the film out there which is so important to everyone out there who's working that you know we always want to see our our projects come Mm. out there for the fans and everyone to enjoy and he's one of the best people I know when it comes to that too he's very um, on point with making sure that the films get out and they get really good um, press He's really good with press, too, and he oh, doesn't definitely. leave anyone out. You always feel very, very involved in the process, and then you always feel very appreciated at the end, which is super important, too. No, definitely. Now, now you've, you've done a lot of films over the last few years, and I was looking through uh, your IMDb earlier, and um, one film called Clown Motel, I'm pretty sure I saw a version of it at our local supermarket a couple of, markets, uh, a couple of months ago. And um, yeah, I think you probably have. <laughs> Tell us about Clown Motel. Good, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, it's gotten some really good worldwide uh, responses. It's out in I don't even know how many countries, but it's really out there all over the place, which is amazing. And I remember going to the premiere and seeing billboards, and just it definitely has a huge presence. It's something that. Um, I'm, I live in Nevada, so I've actually, before filming, I had visited the Clown Motel, and it's such a crazy place. It really is creepy. It has that old graveyard right next to it, and so um, it's a perfect location. And then the story itself was really great, the way they executed it. The cast is absolutely amazing. Um, I, I loved working with everybody. They're just super professional, super cool. And again, um, like with Dustin, just getting things done, making the best product possible, and 
they are working on the sequel now because the first one was so well oh, received. Nice. And I had such a blast on the first one, and I can't give really anything away, but um, the second one, I'm really looking forward to my involvement with that one, too. But it's going to be bigger, and it's going to be more clowns, and it's going to be, you know, bloodier, and all of those things you look for in a sequel. But it's it's a very, it's a huge scale story, what they're doing with the second one, and it comes off of the love that everyone has had for the first one, so... Definitely really excited to work with that team again, for sure. That's fantastic. And one thing I've always noticed is that you've worked on so many different, like, indie films from such, you know, real, like, to the to the most basic levels of doing self-tape kind of stuff. But then you've also worked with B-movie legends and stuff. So, personally, what would you say is your favorite role you've done so far? I think my favorite role that I've done so far, um, it hasn't come out yet. It's part of a series that started as um, High 8, stands for, you know, High Independent 8, like that was their first one. And then the second one is, um, I believe it's, High Fear is the one that I'm on, I believe. I have to look up, there's three of them though, and I don't know why I'm blanking out. But the one that I am, really really proud of is my segment for that one so if you look it up look up um brad slice is the director and i feel like it was a very emotional role but you're not expecting it and we were isolated out in a cabin and the woods were so beautiful but eerie and it's a role that was super challenging for me but it turned so darkly beautiful that I'm super proud of my performance and the opportunity that they gave me to work on with that. And the story is something that I think is going to leave its mark for sure, especially given what everyone's been through with this year. So again, I I don't want to give too much away, but yeah, high fear. It's H I and then fear. You Uh, look that one up. That one's coming soon. So I I love everything that I've worked on. It's really it's hard to say for sure what my favorites would be because I take something very personal and very special away from everything that I work on. So I have love for everything that I've done. Just sometimes um, more of the emotional stuff, you get to release something with that. So you Mm. put a little extra special bit of yourself into it, I guess is what I would say. Do you ever think, um, because you were saying earlier, like at the beginning that you went in, originally hoping well not hoping but writing do you ever look to write in the future or are you writing anything for yourself or for actors around you i am it's something i've been working on for over a decade it's it's a part personal experience i had and the people that i witnessed throughout all of it it has more of a supernatural twist to it um i will say it's you know kind of goes with a subgenre and horror that I really, really love. So it, it fit really well with my visual kind of idea to throw in there. Mm. So I was working on it again at the beginning of the year and I made a lot of progress. But then I kind of got distracted and lost my focus. But I'm really aiming, I was aiming for the summer to have it done, but now I'm going to push it to the end of the year to hopefully get it together to where I want it to be, where I can send it off and start looking at who I want to take it over and make it come to life. Nice. And I mean, like you've had the love for 10 years, so you'll get it, you'll get it done on, on that scale. It's coming. It's got it. I mean, I'm, this is, I, I would love to jump off and make other stories, but I really have to, I can't push it or force it but I really want to make sure this is the one that gets done and left behind and given to people to make something, you know, that everyone can enjoy out of it. No, that's fantastic. Um, so despite lockdown right now, what kind of things are you um, either working on from self-tape or are hoping to be shooting once things calm down? Well, I have a couple um, that I've worked on from home. It's been keeping me busy. There's a few more that I want to complete and get turned in there hopefully in a timely manner that I can be a part of it um with everything going on it's hard some days 
to pull yourself up and focus, but mm. working on things from home has really been a huge help. So there's been a couple, um, for Tony Newton's one, uh, Dustin Ferguson again, and then there's some other voiceover that I've done and a couple other projects that have been more so um, just bits and pieces to try to contribute and stay creative while everything gets back together in the world. Yeah. So I have one last question for you. Um, do you have like a, a, a dream project? Now, when I say that, I also kind of mean like if there's a key character you've always wanted to play or a key performance that you'd love to deliver in a film. Is there anything you've always thought about? There is. I I would love, and I actually have, have in the past year or so gotten to get a little closer and a little bit closer to where I want to be with some of these performances. Um, but I would love to be more of a killer or more of a deranged, just multi-leveled, really scary kind of character. I love prosthetics. I love working with gore. So something that would include that and the last roommate, I was really close with that one. Um, I got to get some real crazy out there, which was super fun. But I would like to go into more roles like that where, you know, I get to be more of a monster instead of someone who is fighting the monster. No, I totally get you. I mean, I've spoken to um, a few a few actresses, and whenever you get offer a more psychotic role, they... There's a desperation to just dive into it because there's so much more depth you can explore. It's great to get... I love psychological films too, so it's great. You know, I want things... You always prepare and you put yourself into roles, but I want something that's going to take like months of preparation and getting really dark and really immersive to have like a really complex performance to portray out there just because I feel it would be a really great release and it would also be something that... I could put my mark on that would really just give me something to look at and go holy crap not only did I execute that well but I lived through it (laughs) just the ultimate experience immersive experience with the whole production side of it new take on that (laughs) well thank you so much for joining us and um, I hope you have a lovely day thank you I just fixed my brain fart real quick too so hi eight it's horror independent eight and the middle movie is High Death, so H-I and then Death. And then my segment is the third installment anthology. It is High Fear, so H-I Fear. I don't know why I blanked with the, the middle um, installment, but yeah, that's it's what it stands for and, and the whole one. It's from Nightfall Pictures. No worries. We'll, we'll put a link to uh, either a trailer or a film at the in the information bit below. Thank you. And yes, I I very much love um, all these films and I'm really looking forward to everything coming up. And I can say for sure that Clown Motel 2 for sure is moving forward and finding a safe path to production to resume. So that and many others are coming up and I'm really happy. And thank you again for having me and for talking to me. And I always love keeping in touch with what you're doing too. So thank you for everything that you do for the community as well. Thank you very much. You uh, well, I don't know how to respond to that properly. Um, but thank ah! you very much. <laughs> that was a cracking interview, Sam. Thank you for that. And um, moving on, so we decided that we want to do something um, in terms of satire and how satire is used within films. And um, one of the biggest things for me with that is actually Anchorman and how yeah. the news is depicted. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, and I just love that film and. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. It's, it's the way it sends up the, uh, the well, the Anchorman uh, as this sort of font Macho. of all knowledge of, like, you know, that the, the everyone would watch on their TV and he would give them the truth very seriously and they just take this this character and send it up entirely and, and make him ridiculous. Over-glorified. <laughs> exactly. And high on his, high on his own... Um, uh, on his high horse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's... Uh, <laughs> it's just a ridiculous character and perfectly encapsulates what's wrong with uh, American news and, and the trust that's sort of put into it. I think it's interesting with um, Anchorman too because they <clears throat> that's all around time of 24-7 news as well. Mm. And it is that whole sort of... 
uh, identity crisis within the satire as well because in yeah. the first one it's like the white male is dominant and then it's a it's a white female coming along and then the third um, third one in the second it's more that there's a, a general diversification because of 24 hour news mm. and um I think that's the one thing you get a lot with satire there's that almost sense of a, a threat so just to make clear with what satire to us in films it's it's like um, it's commentary, but it's reflection on something. So it could be an industry, it could be society, it could be politics. And Anchorman, yeah, very much kind of... Well, well, it, a satire always exposes the truth about something in some way by ridiculing it or by um, attacking it generally and, and making it something that's, uh, you know, otherworldly, like, like uh, for example, or society. Grander, grander than it is. Yeah. Over glorifying it. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, or, or sort of twisting it and distorting it. So in in society, um, the the upper class characters are part of this uh, part of this society, and they essentially feed off the the life force of the poor. Um, and they, you know, they're they're some otherworldly monstrous creature, um, but not aliens, but something you know that's not quite human. Is that the either. film you watched the other day. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, the hands. Very, very strange, <laughs> uh, strange film. I always walk in on Sam and Jack's um, viewings of films at the wrong points, and there's just hands everywhere. <laughs> I just, oh, yeah, I don't know what the heck was going on. <laughs> I think with um, uh, society and kind of satire in general there's like a knowingness mm. a knowingness of the the ridiculousness and a sort of borderline absurdity so in society they constantly repeat the words society you're going to be part of society so mm. you know as knowing it's like there is something up here there is something strange going it's on kind of being drilled in yeah yeah and it doesn't even like it's really like you say drilling in it's smacking you in the head by <laughs> the end of the film yeah yeah and i think that's what good satire does it mm. does need to be like really hit you around the face with it, so you're like, shit, why, why, why does that kind of thing happen? Yeah. Rather than being more like subtle. Yeah, I think that I think that by sort of depicting it and and taking it to an extreme, satire allows kind of a release of of being able to laugh at the ridiculous situations. Mm that we genuinely find ourselves in when you sort of like look at the world well, and think, think even, about it. If you take that point, even the ridiculous situations that have happened in history, mm. so like the death of Stalin, yeah. for example, yeah. they, they take a, a very poignant point that was probably quite dark and they turn it into comedy and yeah. make it like this slapstick sort of, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, by sort of sending up the, uh, the, the leaders of, of the... Uh, regime, you know, after Stalin's death, they made them just ridiculous figures that, yeah. that didn't really make any sense. Well, whatsoever. they even reinforced that by not pushing for Russian accents, mm. by giving a lot of the cast their natural accents and just yeah. bringing that personality in. It's just such a strange thing to hear Yorkshire accents going like, you know, being very communist. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and Stalin with a Cockney accent. Was yeah, just Sammy, yeah. <laughs> it's so like random. some East End gangsters. <laughs> but that's Armando Anucci, as we know, like he's a, he is very much one of the, the top guys for satire. Mm. I mean, like obviously on the TV stuff, there's the thick of it and Veep, but that led towards the the film in the loop. Didn't realize that was satire. Yeah, yeah, yeah completely. Yeah, Peter Capaldi. Yeah, yeah, the the thick of it is just sending up politicians, essentially exposing how how vapid and. So it's a and, commentary, isn't it? So then, the office. The office, to a certain extent, is yeah, it's a satire. I mean, it's, it's not satire it's, of office. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. it's a satire of employment itself, probably, mm. and the pointlessness of it all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's true. Like a for that. <laughs> <laughs> when Armando Nucci did it with in the loop, like he kind of. Because it brings obviously Peter Capaldi's character from the thick of it into like a, a bigger kind of playground, I suppose, mm. with the eve of a sort of, because it's pretty much like an Iraq war, two thousand and three. We want to get in there. How are we going to get in there? Yeah. And I think one of the things Armando does so good with satire is he will see it from every single angle. Mm. He'll show you from the Republicans, the Democrats, but he'll show you from the the smaller people within Washington, and then a moment which I think is kind of genius. He does the whole smaller case in Britain, 
where Steve mm. Coogan's got the wall. <laughs> and he just keeps like screaming about the wall and it's his mum's going to fall over. His garden wall. wall's fallen down. Oh. <laughs> it's a yeah, it's one of the <laughs> I think I think I that's see in, that happening in everyday life. Yeah. <laughs> you see that a lot in, especially when you got satire that's trying to be global. So mm -hmm. another case of the one that we watched recently was Mars Tax. Yeah, that has the same thing. You see it on all the different levels, but you're gonna see it on an absurd small level of how this big thing has affected everything around it. Mm. And you do see that quite a lot in satire. Yeah. Would would okay? Sorry to touch, uh, like uh, to butt in, but then like, would you use or would you say Scream is kind of a satire? No, no, I wouldn't. Because it's a self-aware of a horror film. It's we, a met. It's meta. It's a. The thing is, it's meta and it's satire. It's it uses elements of satire, but I wouldn't say it's like purely. I wouldn't say it's. It's pure not so self-aware that. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's yeah. it, it's parodying horror to a certain extent, but satire usually targets um, it's sort of belief systems or, or, or uh, you know, part things within society that are. Um, are prevalent uh, things like like employment, like politics, like you religion. know those, yeah, religion. There is yeah, like exactly. that slim line though, because we've been trying to work out all week what is parody and what is satire. Mm. The parody tends to kind of mimic. Yeah, so the, the scary thing. movies, for example, yeah, would or, be parody. Or the Naked Gun kind of films. They're yeah. definitely a parody film because it just mimics crime crime films. Mm. And satire just makes a bit more of a commentary on it rather than just showing you like. They'll mimic archetypes and stereotypes. So every character is going to be over the top yeah. representation of like, especially in stuff like, um, like what, well, like Mars Attacks or In the Loop, you know, because mm. it's got so many different players at different points globally. Um, they're all kind of over the top, so you can just kind of identify with them to get the commentary that's being said. Mm. And I think most uh, satires tend to be, although it's not like a sort of strict rule or anything but they tend to be ensemble pieces because you end up seeing all different elements of that mm. society and how it affects each other and you just get these little glimpses of these characters um that that is designed to sort of send up those elements of society and make them uh yeah ridicule them <laughs> yeah which um on a like a smaller level less global level you've got christopher guest's mockumentaries mm. so best in show a mighty wind for your consideration mascots yeah. uh waiting for guffman yeah those are clearly satires mm. but it's enthusiasts within each kind of like their huge world to them but so small and kind of like singular so even um the the mighty wind mm. It's all the folk entertainment scene. And it, it mixes that line between parody as well because it mimics the perfect music and the music videos and the look of all of the folk groups within like, and, and their identity. It, it's, there's elements of like classic actual folk musicians and the sort of lives they've had with you know, the breakups and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But I'd still say it was a satire because it just... It just shows you that whole entire world again behind the scenes, the the people coming in together, everything. Mm. And uh, it it's sort of uh, again it it's that thing of it exposing the truth about about some of these things, like like the the stereotype of the of the sort of uh, pinicky uh, uh, musician that is like really really particular and sort of insistent that something yeah. has to be pronounced a certain way or 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 that you've got to sing exactly in this way or you know something like that you know you've always got these characters within um, the music world that are like, are like that and this this film sends it up beautifully is obviously perfected in spinal tap yeah which is definitely a satire oh like, yeah yeah and and i think i think in a way spinal tap used the i just love the way the 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 characters use the British accent and because and, uh, yeah. there's always an assumption in America, you know, that the, the idea that British accent sounds Tiny like hand. people know what they're talking <laughs> about kind of thing. But these, these, uh, you know, these, these uh, rock stars were just stupid, just totally stupid. I love the fact that with, well, you know, when a satire works, when different metal bands watched it and walked out because they thought it was about them. <laughs> That's when you know something works with a satire, when your audience just walks out, but it's yeah. not the direct audience, because most satire isn't directly aimed at one thing. 
mm. is just the representation of that thing. Yeah, it tends to sort of focus on on social problems that are mm. larger than just one individual, one group, or something like that. But in that, people recognise their own faults, uh, and sometimes that upsets them, doesn't it? So then, is Get Out? Yeah, yeah. That would come under a satire because it's very self-aware of. Well, yeah, it's the possession of the white devil. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah, I think that the the get out kind of it it satirizes racism, but satirizes racism on the left that is yeah. like you know, or the left wing establishment or what's well, considered to be left wing. There's that perfect line, <laughs> isn't there? Like mm. um, I w <clears throat> Obama, I would have voted for him for a third time. Yeah, and of course, then that guy like fucking wants to scalp him and. You know all the madness that happens later on in the film. Yeah, and that and again with satire, it becomes perfect memes in our it's our, our society, and those little phrases get shared around everywhere to represent a certain thing. You hear that phrase, you now know what it means. It means like a more in the middle, center, like right, left kind of Democrats politician yeah. sort of person. Yeah, exactly. A elite, a liberal yeah. elite, essentially, um, and that just comes from. I think with Get Out, Jordan Peele's a comedian. Mm. Yeah. But he always had an eye on what was going on in society. If you've ever watched any of his Key and Peele sketches, yeah, yeah. they're very much social commentary. Yeah. And he brought that perfectly in Get Out. He does the same thing with Us, but Us is definitely a horror film. And I, I was thinking about it um, recently, you know, uh, as as when in 2016 when Trump won the the presidential election, there's a lot of people saying, "Oh, satire is dead because no, uh, you know it's, it's been that long. It, it, yeah, it's been a long, <laughs> long time." Um, but uh, you know, satire is dead uh, because uh, you know the, these things are actually happening for real now. So you know, no one no one needs to write it anymore. Um, but like, I feel like that missed the point of satire entirely. Yeah. Um, and actually. We've had more satire since, uh, you know, more hard hitting satire since Trump. Um, when you look previously to like uh, during the Obama times, that was when um, the interview came out, for example, which I think satis uh, satirizes um, um, uh, sort of entertainment media mm. really, really well. Um, but it felt like it should have been quite a, like a political film because they're interview interviewing Kim Jong um, Un, so uh, they I feel like the film kind of missed the missed the mark on it in some ways. Um, but at the time, you know, Still during a good that film, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, but I, I think uh, at the time, you know, satire wasn't as hard hitting, and now yeah. now that things have got a bit more serious, and we have got a total lunatic. Uh, in the highest position of power in the world, um, satire's really brought up its A-game. I think um, with, so, with satire in general, especially, especially like social satire, it does become images imprinted in your mind. So like, think about Dawn of the Dead. Mm. Dawn of the Dead is a social satire on consumerism. That's why the zombies go to the supermarket. That's why yeah. they carry on doing the same thing. That's mm. interesting. And then after that, you're a, that whole association of the idea of like, oh, look, and walk around like zombies. Mm. Or, um, what's that date? Black Friday. Mm. That mm. kind of thing. Everyone will instantly, again, memes, will just intercut it with a photo from Dawn of the Dead. And that's what satire or, does. Or Doctor Strange love with the with the room, uh, the war room. Yeah. Um, that is such a. Every time I think about you know these evil like <laughs> evil politicians and army generals sitting around planning their war, I go there. But yeah. Oh, my one is Shaun of the Dead. It's like the only way to be safe is go to the pub. <laughs> <laughs> See the um, it's interesting to talk about uh, Doctor Strange love because obviously Doctor Strange love is one of the most probably the most famous satires of all mm. times. And there are so many iconic imagery that has been repeated in so many different things. It's like the image of the guy putting the cowboy hat on, getting on the bomb and... Yeah, riding, riding, riding the missile. Riding it's about to go down and stuff. And it's, <clears throat> but that image in itself is such a powerful image because mm. it's someone who's clearly just seen himself as a soldier, not like high up in the army. He's like, I'm going to take it on for the boys. He's doing it for... Well, he's, I think he's gotten crazy at that point, but... He's doing it for like the bigger cause and he's lassoing out like a cowboy, you know, it's, mm. it's such a, yeah, it says a lot about class and how class will do anything for what they think they're supposed to do. 
especially in a military sense. Yeah, and, and I what think their principles sort of um, allow them to do. If yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I think with political satire, um, particularly, it, it tends to go to that like cartoony extent because that's probably where the satire genre comes from. Is those those cartoon, uh, you know, newspaper yeah, yeah. things of like they would send up politicians in newspapers mm. and stuff through cartoons, um, and that's like that. Those images just seem to be almost directly out of that kind of world yeah. of of creation and imagination. Um, and, and yeah, like that, it, it's really interesting to think of it that way. Well, the thing is, these subjects are either addressing are either a too big for people to take on because not everyone wants to be tuned into the news, or that they're, they're slightly taboo subjects. Mm. So if you think about um, Crystal Morris's Four Lions. Yeah, I thought you were going to say that. Oh, I love Four it's Lions. It's a very taboo film, though. Like <clears throat> that, In any other hands, that could have been like, well, this is too dark, or this is too too much, or it's not got the right angle, it's not showing it, for, it's showing it too, from a more racist perspective. It could have gone either way. Mm. But Christopher Morris being a master sat uh, satirist, and he spent like five years researching the hell out of it, he got those well-rounded human characters mm. and the satire came out of how ridiculous that they were involved in the whole you know um al-qaeda thing yeah it wasn't yeah. about like them being ridiculous although they were ridiculous characters it kind of uh, to me it's kind of satirized <laughs> like the the daily mail's thinking on what <laughs> these people were like yeah, it yeah. took the piss out of that by showing it like as you know as if as if that was really the reality of what was going on uh, uh, you know uh, it was, yeah, yeah, it was good for that. I funny. love that when he blows up the sheep. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Sorry, I don't agree with animal cruelty or anything, but... I don't think they really did. I know, but <laughs> it's, it's so unexpected. And like it just, again, reinforces the idea of how silly of characters that they are, yeah. I suppose. But, and and they're, they're almost pointing the finger at themselves and laughing that they could get themselves into this ridiculous situation and something so ridiculous could happen. But it's within a much more serious and dark yeah. that people are terrified to go near, you know? Mm. It's um, the whole idea of taboo being used in satire. Like I said, it's, it's from commentary of journalism. But when you've got um, the film The Producers, yeah. Mel Brooks film, Mel Brooks said a brilliant thing where he basically said, like, the best way to face things like Hitler is to take the piss out of him, to make comedy out of him. Mm. And that's what he does beautifully in Producers. Not only does he mock Hitler, but he also mocks the rich's attitude towards, you know, like, or the elite's attitude towards taboo subjects. Yeah. And, that, and the whole theatre industry in itself. Yeah, and I think the the nature of insurance too, the the fact that you can you can make more money from from a flop than a hit, um, is and, it, and satire you know. with that sort of film it, it falls into almost a farce. Mm. So it's very farcical, and the characters, especially in the producers, are all very over the top and ridiculous mm. to keep the comedy kind of flowing. But it does still, yeah, when it plays with taboos and class and stuff, it, it's very much on the forefront. But those ridiculous characters and sort of like four, four lions to some degree you've got the human side but you've got those ridiculous characters in quite a more serious discussion here you know mm. and I think Mel Brooks was doing a similar thing with well, why can't we talk about what the Nazis did without having to be like you shouldn't be talking about that by you know mm. doing springtime for Hitler <laughs> <laughs> would then like Tarantino films come under satire even in the slightest Cause... I'd say more homage well, yeah, because well, if you think in about Inglorious Bastards, um, or even Once Upon a Time, I think it Hollywood, uses satire. Yeah, to, there's to, elements. Yeah, the, like the, there's certain bits where they'll send up characters. I think it's bit, more of a respect thing than a commentary thing. No, no, I mean, I mean, like the way that they, the the way that they would have like a Nazi character, for example, would kind of be uh, it would be taking the piss out of those those attributes and those type the type of things to a certain extent yeah. i mean i don't think it's it's not like comedy it's completely as satire. we know it but then like ho you know horror can satirize without being funny uh, get out for example uh, wasn't funny but it it, it certainly no but it used all my entertainment in in the way to be able to do it so yeah. like society isn't hilarious it's absurd but, um, oh, I think there's bits of it that are kind of funny. It though. is, it's, yeah, it's, but, but that's why entertainment silly. does, isn't it? Entertainment's mm. there to, it's, it's going to hit you on every single level, mm. you know? Oh, yeah. Um, it's actually funny that you say about the horror films. 
Horror can be used in a very nice way like that. There's a film called The, uh, the Stuff. Stuff is made by Larry Cohen. It's, uh, it's basically like this white yogurt stuff that is so addictive and everyone's got it and it's in every substance. It's basically Coca-Cola. It's clearly <laughs> Coca-Cola. But they use it in everything and eventually this stuff starts to like attack them. Uh, but it's obviously a clear commentary on consumerism. Oh no, I know. And a lot of the 80s played nicely into um, that, that sort of questioning this very much yuppie lifestyle. And I think society, stuff, even to some degree, even though we argued about it earlier in the week, American Psycho plays on the yuppie, it satirises, you know, what it is to be a yuppie and how you'd rather want to be a serial killer. <laughs> but it, it, there, there is definitely, yeah. you can see like a line of how when society thinks it has this falsehood of everything's okay, more satire kind of comes in. Mm. I was going to say um, Jojo Rabbit. No, <clears throat> that's not a satire. I I I think it is actually. I think I think it satirizes again. It, like it, it targets the Nazi ideology and the way that it indoctrinates yeah, children no, yeah, and true. and sort of the yeah. It, I think I think it definitely does because the the Nazis are all ridiculous in that. As much mm. as they're like horrible and evil at the same time, and it was a perfect balance between the two. Um, they yeah, it, it does it does take the piss out of out of them and expose their ridiculousness in my head so like before we sat down and discussed um what we wanted to do in terms of the podcast um i didn't really understand satire and you know f through discussions and stuff that we've had it's kind of become more apparent to me of like like i would have thought satire was more comical so you're you're identifying with an issue or a, a subject matter and you're kind of exposing it in a comical way mm. to a certain degree um, and you're self-aware of that <clears throat> but from obviously us talking and stuff I find that there's a lot of serious satires as well yeah. I think if, if you think about the Marvel films one that jumps out in my head is the Winter Soldier um, because that points at the idea of you know people taking over the world and that's not very, I, think, I think that's, that's a conspiracy thriller yeah right? that's I, very much 70s thrillers and would it not it's be a cool, no because it's a callback to it it's not it's playing on like a structure that you understand but it's not like making a massive commentary on anything yeah like a satire what it what it does is is it uses comedy ridicule or um sort of other other ways of doing it to expose truths about um, a belief system, a, a, a something like that, um, and that can be like a very very broad term. I mean, by belief system, that's not just like religion. Um, but yeah, like it, 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 it's more about that than it is about whether it's funny or whether it's uh, you know it, it can you can have a political commentary without it being satire as well you know or or a commentary on anything without it necessarily being satire. It I can think I still need to get my head around. It. <laughs> <laughs> it can also be an easier way to have that discussion about those things because you're entertaining at the end of the day. Well, that's why the death I think that's what satire work does so well with. Mm. The death of Stalin or even the interview, you're taking a, a subject matter that's quite sensitive and flipping it on its head and making it very self-aware to the point where it is quite funny to watch. And especially with like the interview, you kind of watch it going, oh, oh, this is quite funny, but North Korea is probably going to bomb us now. <laughs> but it's funny. Like, yeah, yeah. and it is self-aware. Cool. Hope you guys enjoyed um, the podcast today. As ever, give us a like. Leave a comment, subscribe, and uh, give us a share. This week, we won't be doing a midweek interview. And next week, we're actually going to be doing a, a bit more of a, a dissect of trash arts and who we are. Um, so look forward to that next Sunday. So yeah, hopefully you enjoyed this. And we'll see you again next week. Trash Arts Takeout. Bye-bye.